Okay, so my name is uh, Britta Wenzel. I'm the Executive Director for Save Barnegat Bay. I'd like to welcome all of you and thank you for taking time out of your day to uh, join us this afternoon to hear from our wonderful students that were involved in the student grant program this year. Uh, we started this program back in 2007. Um, the late Pete McLean had the idea of having a student grant program where we would provide scientific mentors to students. And I think Jim Merritt and John Wenick, are you both original members of that committee going back to 2007? And Willie, right? Indeed. Yeah, so yes. we've been going strong for a number of years and every year it's, um, some years it's more competitive than others. This year we chose eight students. Five students would be studying the Toms River and three students would be looking at for water quality, sorry, and three students, uh, the Sedge Island Marine Conservation Zone off of the back of Island Beach State Park to look at biodiversity. So we're gonna do this in two team presentations. Jason Kelsey, maybe you wanna wave, so everybody knows who you are. He's gonna put up the screen for the Sedge Island Marine Conservation Zone team. You'll get to meet the team members as the program goes on. And then John Wenick will put up the water quality students report. Uh, the only other introductions I wanted to make was our uh, education and outreach coordinator, Grace Ann Taylor, is on board. She's gonna be monitoring the Facebook live feed and always has lots to contribute. And our longtime president, Willie DeCamp, I believe is on. There's Willie. And a few other board members, Ed Vienkowski and Karen Argenti. I think that's all I see as board members. So I hope you enjoy. If you have questions along the way or comments, please share them in the chat. We'll try to be as responsive as we can along the way. And um, if we don't get to your question or comment at the end of each presentation, we will take additional questions and comments. Does that sound fair? All right, Jason, take it away. All right. So I'm just going to share this. Okay. Everyone can see that? Okay. Um, so my name is Jason Kelsey. I am an instructor at the at Mates, and um, this is my fourth year mentoring this project, looking at the biodiversity of the Sedge Island Conservation Zone behind Island Beach State Park. Um, it's in the tenth year of the overall study, and uh, so it's pretty exciting in that. Uh, we have a long-term data set, and that's one of the goals of this project. Um, it was originally part of Governor Chris Christie's 10-point plan for Barnegat Bay to collect data about the bay, and specifically in this part, looking at the conservation zone. Um, so normally, we do 10 non-consecutive days of sampling, and we look at sites within the conservation zone and areas outside of the conservation zone. However, because of COVID restrictions this year, it kind of threw a wrench logistically into our study. So we looked at five days sampling within the conservation zone and then five days out of the conservation zone. So in the zone, we were able to use a small John boat to access our sites. Whereas at Tice's, which is our focus point for the outside zone this year, we had to walk the sample equipment out. So we actually increased our sample set there just to kind of account for us walking through the water, disturbing any critters that might be there. So we kind of increased our sample set there. Um, and the rest of my crew can kind of go into more detail about that as they start the presentation here. So um, I'll get started on that. Hi everyone, I'm Kate. I'm a sophomore at Stevens and I am majoring in naval engineering with a minor in coastal engineering. Hello, my name's Brady. I'm a freshman at Bowdoin College, majoring in biology, minoring in math. Hey everybody, I'm Sarah Quigley. I'm a sophomore at Berry College. I'm majoring in biochemistry and minoring in Spanish. So first, some history about the project. As Mr. Kelsey mentioned, it originated with former governor of New Jersey, Chris Christie's 10 point plan for Barney at Bay, which included a lot of projects for restoration, protection, and assessment of the bay. It received yearly funding for the New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife and Safe Barney at Bay, and has since 2017. Overall, this is the 10th consecutive year of the project. 
Previous studies, first, one by Paul Javoff in 2013, essentially showed that taking into account richness and evenness, which we'll talk about in a second, there is no difference in diversity between inside the bay or inside the conservation zone and outside the conservation zone. More recent studies have shown that there are slightly smaller sizes of organisms within the zone, which support the conservation zone that was studied as a nursery for young fish and crabs. So as far as project goals go, the first goal was to maintain this continual data set from the past years of the project of biodiversity within the conservation zone for management by the New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife. The second goal is to compare the biodiversity and size of organisms inside and outside of this Hedge Island Marine Conservation Zone. So it starts with blue crabs, which is a very important commercial species, and the fish they eat at lower trophic levels. But as we'll talk about in a second, it affects many other species at higher trophic levels, such as ospreys. So here's a diagram showing basic food web of Barney at Bay. So it starts with macroalgae, then macroalgae is eaten by shrimp, shrimp is eaten by fish and crabs, and the smaller fish are also eaten by crabs, but are eaten by larger fish. And as you can see in the top right, larger fish are eaten by ospreys. So even though we're just studying these middle three organisms, the fish, shrimp, and the crabs, for example, if we notice declining shrimp populations, that might result in declining oh, populations of blue claws and eventually ospreys. So this small study can have an effect on the entire food web. So talking about our sampling sites, first is the Sedge Island Mar Marine Conservation Zone off Island Beach State Park, New Jersey. It was established in 2001 in parts by the efforts of Pete McLean to minimize anthropogenic impacts on the area. And so while a lot of recreational activities are allowed, such as birding, kayaking, and recreational fishing, commercial fishing and the use of personal watercrafts is not allowed. It was the first marine conservation zone established in New Jersey, and it consists of a lot of ecologically important marshlands that are used by the aforementioned fish and crabs, in addition to many bird species and diamondback terrapins. Area-wise, it makes up about 2% of Barnea Bay. Taishi Shoal is located about three miles north of where we were sampling in the conservation zone, and it's almost the opposite. So it has a lot less restrictions. So commercial fishing is allowed, personal watercraft use is very common, as is personal boat use. The bottom picture shows an event, yearly event called Float Shella, in which a hundred or hundreds of boats gather in the area. And ecologically, it consists of almost entirely bare service habitat. So there's a lot less diversity habitat wise compared to sedge. So Kate and I are just going to be going over some of the methods we used for this project. First things first, we wanted to talk about precautionary measures we took to guard against COVID-19. So the first thing we did was social distance, which actually wasn't very difficult because we were outside, it wasn't hard. Uh, the next is that we all wore face coverings. We mostly wore neck gaiters, which were also helpful in the sun. You can see Kate in that picture wearing one right there. All of our equipment was rinsed in salt water because we were in the bay, and which was convenient. And we all also had separate tasks to minimize cross-contamination. So for example, Mr. Kelsey was really the only one using the DNet to scoop out species. Okay, so here we are gonna go through some maps of our sample sites. So on this one, you can see in the purple dots is the Sedge Island sites that we went to, and the green square shows the Ticey sites. And then further to break that down, the, one, the map on the left shows the Sedge sites. The Circles are where we sampled bare substrates. The triangles are where we sampled mixed or macroalgae substrates. And the green hexagons are where we went for SAB sites. And then at Tysties, as Sarah will mention a little bit later, um, we only had access to bare substrate there. So all of those dots are all the same, but we tended to try and walk out and as Mr. Kelsey talked about, since we weren't on a boat, we had to drop a couple more times in the bare substrate to make sure that we weren't scaring away all the species. And then this map breaks down which areas we caught the biggest amount of species in one drop. So as you can see, those three red circles are highlighting those areas where we 
caught um, larger catches than normal. The total catch average was 125. So those sites were um, pretty high compared to the rest of the sites that we were at. Everyone just heard Kate talking about the different types of substrates on those maps. Uh, I just wanted to break them down for everybody in case anybody didn't know what they were. So first is SAV beds, and that stands for submerged aquatic vegetation. In the zone, it was primarily eelgrass and widgeon grass, and that's 100% coverage. So anytime we were looking at that, it was complete coverage. Next is a kind of intermediary, which is macroalgae or a mixed bottom substrate, and that just has algae in it and uh, along with sediment and bare surface. And so that was not always 100% covered when we surveyed it, so we did mark down how, how much of the algae was present. The third substrate type is bare surface, and basically there's no vegetation there at all. It's just sediment. And as Kate measure, mentioned, at Taishi Shoal, we exclusively surveyed bare surface. So the first thing we did every day of our internship this summer was first pick a site. And we did that based on substrate and cylinder height, which I'll talk about in just a second. Once we chose our site, we gathered some information just about the quality of the area, such as time and GPS location, weather, we measured wind velocity using a kestrel, which is that red instrument you can see in the corner of the slide. We measured depth, tidal flow, current, using a flow meter and using our YSI 85, which is that other instrument on the slide, we measured dissolved oxygen, salinity, and water temperature. So once this initial information was gathered, monitoring the conditions, what we did was take this cylinder apparatus, which you can see at the graphic at the bottom of the slide, and we dropped it onto the substrate. And we noted the percent coverage and bottom composition type. And as you can see, the cylinder is no deeper than one meter, so that limited where we could drop the cylinder at all. And once the cylinder was in the substrate, we gathered the samples using a D-net, which you can also see in that picture, and scooped it into sorting bins, where we collected the specimens and identified them and measured them. And once there were five consecutive scoops where there were no specimens gathered at all, we considered the cylinder to be empty and moved it to a similar substrate. For each sample day, we did do two cylinder drops at each type of substrate location at Sedge and six times at Tyses, just to make sure that we were getting a representative um, example of what was in the area. Okay, so now we're gonna go over some of the data and trends that we found. So before I go into these species specifically, um, or just our total numbers, we broke down the population numbers and the size numbers um, based off of the six most popular species that we caught. So those are the two shrimp that you see there, two fish and two crabs. And you can see on these graphs that certain species tend to um, prefer particular bottom substrates over others. So the shore shrimp really like the macroalgae and the blue crab and the black fingered mud crab really like the um, SAV beds. And then we also just made a graph of the total populations that we found at each substrate. So you can see that we found many more species at the SAV and macroalgae sites than we did at the bear and we found the most at macroalgae sites. Here you can see charts looking at fish, shrimp, and crabs. So breaking down organisms' preferences for SAV, or for um, bottom substrate. So you can see that fish and crabs seem to prefer SAV over macro, and they prefer macro over bear, whereas shrimp follow the trend of the organisms as a whole as well, preferring macro over SAV and SAV over bare surface. Next, we looked at size distribution at sedge between the three bottom substrates. So we did stats using a post hoc to see, to look for statistical differences between the sizes at the different substrates. So none were found with the shrimp. So the sizes are all around the same between substrates. 
here it was actually the only statist statistically significant difference, and it was that bare surface, we had significantly smaller silver sides compared to SAV and macroalgae. For fine sticklebacks, there was no difference, and there were no none caught at bears. There was nothing to compare. And then in terms of crabs, there was also no significant difference in sizes between these substrates. So we also wanted to take a look at the biodiversity in the conservation zone and outside of it. So we ran some indices to look at diversity, which is just kind of a measure of the number of species present in an area. And so to measure that, we ran a Simpsons diversity index, and it, that takes into account the number of species present, like I said, as well as the relative abundance of every species. And as you can see in this chart, the macroalgae had the highest diversity and the bare surfaces had the lowest uh, species diversity and Tyses actually had the lowest overall. And we compared that to species evenness using a Shannon Wiener and, uh, index, which basically just measures the distribution of those diverse species and to just check how many of each species are present to see if they're balanced in the area. And something interesting that we noted with that is that it was actually the opposite of the diversity index. So as you can see in the chart, macro algae had the lowest evenness distribution, while bare substrates had uh, at Ticey Shoal had the highest. So basically that means as the species evenness increased, the diversity decreased and vice versa. And just comparing the bare surface in the side of the zone and outside the zone, we ran a Jacquard's index, which basically just checks for similarity and found that they were 57% similar in terms of species. Okay, so when we were out at the site, Sarah mentioned that we collected water quality information. So just to try and make sure that the two sites were similar enough in water quality, we did compare the salinity, water temperature, and dissolved oxygen levels at Sedge versus at Tyses, and we didn't find any significant differences between any of those values. So theoretically, the water quality is um, similar enough at both sites for the species that we found at Sedge to also be found at Tyses. So the reason that we didn't find as many at Tyses is not because the water quality is too poor. And then when we were out at Tyses the first couple of days, we noticed that the um, sand particles at Tyses were much larger than the sand at Sedge, which tended to be more mucky and have finer particles. So we ran some particle size analysis by taking sand samples and um, running them through sieves, which is just a bunch of nets that separate them by particle size. So you can see that the sedge sediment particle size was mostly in the medium category. And the Tyses tended to have a higher percentage of particles in the coarser um, sizes. So that was interesting to note that the sediments were so different at the bare surfaces at Sedge versus at Tyses. Because it is the 10th year of the project, we did want to take a look at the species population trends over the years. So we just made some graphs over the species data from the last five years starting in 2016. Something important to note is that the 2020 data is half of what the what it should be because as Mr. Kelsey mentioned at the beginning of the project there would ordinarily be 20 cylinder drops days of cylinder drops but because of COVID-19 we could only do 10 so just remember that as we're looking at each species so this page shows the shrimp populations over the years and there is a general increase in shore shrimp and a general decrease in sand shrimp Again, the sand shrimp in the graph look very small, but it would be double if it weren't for the restrictions. Um, but those are just the trends that we're seeing with the shrimp this year. For silver side populations, those are highly variable, depending on whether you stumble across an entire school of them or not. Um, so that's remained relatively the same. And you can see the stickleback has been steadily decreasing over the past five years, which we also found interesting. The crabs, again, there's not really much of a difference with them. The blue claw population has been increasing 
and the black fringe mud crab has been decreasing, but not really significantly so. So to summarize, we filled the first goal of the project by adding to the large data set from the previous nine years of the project. And we filled the second goal with this data. So in terms of diversity, we saw that the most diverse substrate was macroalgae, the least diverse substrate was bare surface. And comparing the two sample sites, we saw that Tyses has evenness, but less diversity. And Sedge, which must, was much more diverse, having less evenness because some species dominated. In terms of size, we found that there is no significant difference between sizes of organisms between the substrates with the exception of silver size. We would just like to take this opportunity to thank Safe Barnegat Bay, Mates, Kelly Scott, who's with Island Beach State Park. She helped us a lot this summer while we were sampling, the, and the New Jersey the Fish and Wildlife, along with the state park services and forestry. Very nice job. <laughs> Looks like we might have some questions come in in the chat. Nice job. That's <laughs> Do folks want to ask some questions or um, I don't know if you're all on mute. If anybody has some burning comments or questions they'd like to make. So we have a question from Christine. She's asking, what is evens? I can take this one. Uh, I think she means evenness. That feels right. So evenness is basically just how well each species is represented. So there would be low evenness if there were a hundred silver side but one blue crab. That wouldn't be very even. So the reason that there's a, a high evenness at Tysi's Shoal is just because there was such a low number of anything that they were all represented pretty evenly. Right. It was like one pipefish was caught and one lady crab was caught and one sand shrimp. So because all of the population numbers were the same, they were very evenly distributed, even though the diversity was far lower than in the conservation zone. Does the team want to, can you see the chat? Can you pick off down the questions on your own? Uh, yeah, I see a question about the differences in the flows. So Sarah did mention we looked at the flow meter to um, measure the currents. So we did actually compare these, but it, um, nothing was really significant between the two because the sites are so different. Sedge is very protected from um, like harsher weather, whereas Tyses is super open to the majority of the directions, especially when it comes to wind. So we found that the average current was higher at Sedge, um, but the Tysi sample days, most of the days that we went out there, it was super choppy and the waves were coming in towards the shore. So um, looking at the actual flow meter numbers, there wasn't much to compare, um, but when you like actually go and visit the site, there's a very large difference between um, the current and like the calmness of the water at Sedge versus at Tysi's. Interesting. Uh, the cylinder was, had, uh, I believe, a diameter of one meter. I see that someone asked how wide it was. I was just curious, like, not deep, like, wide, just out of curiosity, like, a size. So, like, what, because I saw it up against the pole with the, uh, I guess, the net. So, was it, like, four feet, maybe? Three, two? Yeah, it was about a meter wide and a meter deep. Okay, so nice. Okay. It allowed us to capture a square, about a square meter of sample water. Nice. And the size of the cylinder has been maintained the same throughout the whole period of studies for the whole 10 years. Right. Wow. These were the, the original sampling uh, drop chambers, and this may very well be the last summer that they can hold together. <laughs> Falling apart. Yeah. Um, why did you choose Tyses as a comparison site? It's a good question. So Tyses because of normally we have access to a uh, fish and wildlife skiff, so we can actually go to other locations that are a bit further outside of the zone, and we can also explore deeper sections or further sections of the conservation zone, further away from the shoreline. Um, but because of COVID and the state policies, we no longer had access to the fish and wildlife boat, but we only had a small John boat. So that's a pretty short range craft so we were able to just 
access areas that we could either wade out to ourselves and use the boat to carry the equipment and then drop it off of. And there were a couple of days where one or two of the team members had to swim out or wade out to our sites to meet us there. But um, so we basically sampled areas in the conservation zone close to shore. So right near the winter anchorage site or the A21 parking lot. And um, the Tices was the area outside of the conservation zone that was still close enough that we could bring the uh, sampling cylinder down to with any sort of reasonable amount of effort. And this is where Kelly Scott from Island Beach came in. So she or her crew would actually help load that up onto the back of one of their trucks, their facility trucks, and then bring that down to the fisherman's walkway in Island Beach. And then we would carry that out to Tice's. So it was really just out of convenience and feasibility. So we have another question from Michelle. Do you have any metric that can be used to determine if the change in shrimp population impacted the higher trophic organisms? No, not yet. Really, this is something that we just started looking at with the long-term data. So as far as looking to see what the population changes are, like this is the first time we're really looking at it now. Um, and you know, as far as the sample set from this year goes, the like we were saying earlier, the um, the number of samplings has been cut in half just for access. So we have to take that with a little bit of a grain of salt here, but hopefully next year we can bring those numbers back up and really see what's happening. So we have one question from Facebook. Go ahead. Um, given this study is 10 years old, why show stats only for 2016 to 2020? So that had to do with just kind of interpreting a lot of the data from earlier in the years um, and just the amount of time so that we had to really look at the data sets. So over more time and incorporating these numbers into next year, um, we should have more of like a, a true long-term set of, of numbers. So, and I would like to, Sorry, Grisanne, do you have more for that question? Or? I don't for that question, I have another one. <laughs> I was gonna <laughs> jump on for, for Paul here. I think he's got, you know, the burning question for most members of the public, right? The scientists come forward with their information and the public says, well, what does that mean? <laughs> and I'd love to hear sure. uh, how you decide to respond to that because it's always a difficult position between science and policy, right? And science and and what it means to us. So I'll just leave it open to you and give you a chance to uh, see what you have to say. Uh, I can talk about it just a little bit. If someone wants to add off of what I say after, then that'll be pretty great. Um, so something that we really wanted to look at was that Sedge Island is a conservation zone and Ticey Shoal really is not. So something we wanted to do was not only maintain the survey that's been happening over the past 10 years to see if the conservation zone is doing its job to protect organisms, but to see if something not in the zone would really have an impact. And we saw that it really did. So Ticey Shoal is really disturbed. Uh, it has a lot of boat activity all the time. A lot of us on the team, we actually live near Ticey Shoal and we can see all the boats that are there, all the human activity that's going on. So something we really just wanted to do was see how much human activity really can impact the Barnegat Bay. Nice job. And just something to note, when we were there, it was early in the morning. So there were no boats there, um, maybe a handful at certain times. So we experienced the after party. Um, but as far as overall who cares as well, looking at this data, especially looking at the small organisms that are there, um, as Brady was mentioning, these are, you know, it's the base of the food web for Barnegat Bay and taking note of the smaller trophic organisms, um, knowing how much they are, how plentiful they are, um, it could potentially, you know, spell, um, the future population of the larger things that are, you know, more charismatic, if you will, um, or at the very least more commercially important, like the blue claw, um, flounder, fluke, those animals. I think I'll just add from a policy point of view that 
oftentimes the agencies and the scientists who get funded to do these studies, the money goes away for a period of time. And then, you know, there's a loss in data or continuity of data. So one of the objectives is just to try to keep a baseline of data going uh, over time in hopes that, you know, Dr. Jivoff or whomever might get funded at some point and be able to do a more intensive study, uh, but there wouldn't be large gaps in data. We've got a couple more questions here. It's 4.30, so let's try to take these last couple of questions. Yeah, so I see one on the differences between Tyses and Sedge being due to substrate differences or boat traffic. Um, so, I mean, I guess it really just like sinks in more when you actually go to the sites and see the differences between them. So that was one of the main reasons that we actually did look at the different substrates at Sedge um, was because at Bear we were still finding more than at, we would find at a Bear service at Tyses. So out of the five whole days that we were at Tyses and the, um, I guess, 30 drops that we did, we only got 14 total species out of all of those days, whereas we got uh, close to 2,000 at Sedge. So um, I think that definitely the fact that there is no um, sea like seagrass or SAV and macroalgae affects the population numbers, but it would also be affected by the boat population there. 14 versus almost 2,000, yeah. Okay, I think we largely got to the questions, unless Grace Ann, you have anything else? No, I think um, one, someone was asking um, how much the cost of the materials was. Um, so I reassured her that we would replace those things next year, and I think it cost a few hundred dollars, right, to replace those cylinders, so. Well, yeah, field sciences, you have to learn to work cheaply. <laughs> we're we're going we're gonna to try to get it done through the uh, welding program at the uh, vocational school. Yeah. That's great. I want to congratulate the team, the whole team, uh, uh, the leadership, the park. You, you all did a fantastic job for a really challenging summer. We really didn't think it was going to happen, but we, we hung on to the very end, and you did a fantastic job. I thank you so much. It means a lot uh, to our work going forward. So thank you, Jason. Thank you, the, the whole team and the park. Uh, it was really fantastic. Yeah. Nice job. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Now off to John and the water quality team. All right. All right, let's get this going okay. here. All right. How are you? I'm uh, John Wenick. Um, I'm with the water quality monitoring program or team that we've uh, been working with this past summer. Um, looking back on it, it actually started in 2010. Um, the project in terms of like looking at water quality through the Save Barnegat Bay Student Grant Program. And we, in 2010, actually looked at water quality along the Toms River. And periodically we would go back and try to identify where some of the sources may be coming from. And then also look at other parameters and see where they kind of connect. Um, this summer, I was very fortunate to have five um, team members um, that really did a great job. And they'll explain a little bit of what they had to do distancing wise, but it all came together um, thanks to um, the lab over at Save Barnegat Bay that's being developed, but it served as a really great hub. And we were able to pull this off, you know, with distancing in mind and, and sample in a very consistent basis over the period of about eight weeks um, from throughout um, June all the way through July. Um, the students will present their findings. Um, here they are getting ready for the field. You can see they're all happy. Um, I made sure, um, you know, to say, make sure you smile for this, all right? So you don't, <laughs> you know, don't. but they, they did a great job. Um, um, you can see too, they were sporting vests when they went out into the field. It's really cool because it has like water quality on the back and, and uh, the good news is it led to some of them getting, you know, some questions answered from a distance, but they're able to get some questions answered and some assistance even from some of the uh, uh, residents and other people affiliated with some of the towns too, which was, was nice. So um, this project, they'll explain a little bit about where we were sampling on the Toms River, but it's going to be um, important information for us to use as a baseline for a project that will be kicking off uh, formally soon um, that will focus on the Toms River and all of the municipalities around that great river. And uh, 
it was just great working with these individuals this summer. Um, they did an outstanding job. And uh, I'll, I'll wait for the rest of the comments until they're done with their presentation. But I want to introduce uh, the team. They'll introduce as they go along. Um, and you can see a wide variety of colleges. So we'll kind of kick this off now. And uh, let's get going. OK, so going into the, the, our overview, our goal for this project was to gain a baseline of information about basic water quality parameters and pathogens along the Toms River. This, therefore, lets us determine areas that may be sources of pathogenic bacteria that have a negative impact on water quality in the Toms River. And then consequently, it also impacts the Barnegat Bay. So to do this, we sampled at 12 sites along the Toms River. Um, these include sites in Pine Beach, Beachwood, Ocean Gate, Toms River, Island Heights, and South Toms River. So we have the 12 sites, and along the southern end of the river, we have sites one through seven, which are our A sites. And we, along the northern end, we have sites eight through 12, which are B sites. So to start off, our first site, known as A1, is Jeffreys Creek. This was a more secluded site in a more uh, densely residential area. This flows into the mouth of Toms River. And throughout sampling at this location, this did have a prominent sign of wildlife, especially for mallard geese and ducks, along with other uh, animals as well. It's not currently a designated swimming area, but it is a local fishing hotspot. And it is also a natural area helpful in collecting runoff. And it's also very key in flood preventing as well. So our sites in Pine Beach are Site 2 and Site 3. And first we have the Station Road Swimming Beach, which has a history of closings due to unfit water quality. And in June 2018, the beach had to be closed due to consecutive high tests for high bacteria levels due to rain runoff. Then Site 3 is Avon Road Swimming Beach, which also has a history of poor water quality. In 2014, it was ranked one of the worst beaches in New Jersey based on EPA data and 50% of its samples exceed the beach action value for enterococcus bacteria, which that value is 104 colonies per 100 milliliters. But it is currently not a swimming beach due to the shore erosion that has taken place. Next, we have our locations in Beachwood, A4 and A5. We have Beachwood Beach, which has a big history of closures, 47 closures and 24 contamination advisories from 2005 to 2017 due to elevated bacteria levels. And this beach has been designated the worst swimming beach by various articles in these past years due to the history of poor water quality. Um, it's also one of the biggest swimming beaches that we sampled from. Beachwood Yacht Club is a marina with no designated swimming spot, um, but it does have a sailing school and community center on the site, and it is not tested by the New Jersey um, Department of Environmental Protection. So here we have our two southern uh, Toms River sites, A6 Cedar Point and A7 Mathis Park. The surrounding area of these sites is highly commercialized and it sits upon an old infrastructure. For the purpose of this study, this might have little effect, but it's important to note as the environment can be negatively affected for multiple human and or chemical types of non-point source pollution. Both sites are proximal to past sewage and gasification plants that may have had lasting effects on the water quality here. Also, this area was dredged in the past and may experience lasting effects such as uh, degraded habitat and greater concentrations of suspended solids. Okay, so now we have our two locations in Tom's River, our Save Barnegat Bay waterfront at B8 and Money Island at B9. Unlike the southern end of Tom's River, this area is dominated by dense residential coastal development. There are multiple past occasions of chemical contamination all along the Toms River, but areas such as, say, Barnegat Bay and Money Island sit in kind of little coves that may experience less rapid flushing and therefore might reap the most influential negative effects of contaminants in the water. 
Also, the waters here appear to be more cedar-like than other sites due to an influx of tannic acids released from the trees along the coast, such as the common Atlantic white cedar. We sampled at three different locations in Island Heights. The first two were located along Dillon's Creek. So the picture on the left has the two red pins where we took our samples from. And it is said to be an environmentally sensitive area due to the fact that it is next to a wildlife preserve. And then the third sampling spot was at Summit Ave Beach. And this site sits adjacent to where Dillon's Creek empties into the Toms River. And it has had some closures in the past due to high bacteria levels. So going into our procedure, um, here's an outline of the parameters we tested um, and measured at each of the locations we just mentioned. Uh, salinity, water temperature, conductivity, pH, suspended solids, turbidity, chlorophyll, and bacteria, and specifically E. coli in bacteria. So just to jump in, these are a couple of modifications and some precautionary measures we made against COVID-19. Um, what was most important was facial covering, so we wore masks at all times. All team members were to remain six feet apart to prevent social groupings. So this is a shout out to John right here for diligently doing great schedule work uh, and separately signing certain team members to sites A and B to prevent people from large gatherings. Gloves were worn at all times and hand sanitizers were provided. We had bottles assigned to each site for sampling and they were washed after each sampling day. Coolers were also provided to store all the water samples, which also helped in transport, along with minimizing exposure to touching the bottles constantly. And all of our field sampling equipment was sanitized after each day of sampling. And to go into our field sampling protocol, our sampling days were assigned to Mondays and Tuesdays at the beginning of the morning between 7 and 9 a.m. We had a six foot pole used to collect water samples from each site. And using the pole, we would collect water and pour it into a 300 milliliter bottle with the date and time recorded. The bottle samples were used for turbidity, pH, suspended solids, and chlorophyll readings. And we also took a 100 milliliter sample and collected it inside a NASCO World Pack Thio bag, which was used for bacterial testing along with a YSI 556 multimeter for measurements recorded along as well. And just to double on that, we did have routine calibrations in the morning for precise and accurate measurements. Okay, so in the garage lab, we tested four different parameters, pH, suspended solids, turbidity, and chlorophyll A. Our pH was measured using the handheld Oakton 5 meter pictured on the bottom left. The meter was rinsed uh, between each sample to ensure the highest level of accuracy. Chlorophyll and turbidity were both measured using the two, two of the same meters with different calibrations and transmitted settings. The Aquaphor handheld meter is pictured on the bottom right of the slide. Beginning each day, this meter was calibrated and any offset was noted to be added or deducted from the sample's reading. Chlorophyll A was calculated in micrograms per liter and turbidity was calculated in nephilometric turbidity units. The final parameter measured in the garage lab is the suspended solids. A vacuum filtration system was used to pull 100 milliliters sample of the water through filter paper. The paper was first masked before the sample was added and then again the following day after drying out entirely. The difference of these two weights gave us the total mass of that site's suspended solids for the previous day. So the procedure we have for the bacteria testing um, included a 100 milliliter sample collected in the World Pack bags, which is pictured on the bottom left. Um, the 100 milliliter sample was taken at the site and then brought back to the lab. Two milliliters of the water sample was taken with a sterile pipette and mixed into uh, two milliliters of ColSkin Easy Gel, which is pictured next to the World Pack bag. Um, and then the results were reported as 100 milliliters. 
the Easy Gel solidified in Petri dishes, which were incubated, inverted for 24 hours at 37 degrees Celsius. That's a picture of our incubator on the right. And then additionally, we took a duplicate sample at each site over the course of the uh, sampling and to check our consistency of the parameters. A control petri dish was also made for each round of sampling on each day, um, incubated only the two milliliters of the call scan easy gel. And that's a picture of our clear controls that we got each time. So as we move into the results, just a reminder of what each of the sites are and what they represent as we talk about them. So right here, this is a visual representation of the temperature readings from each site throughout the entire program. All sites did show a consistent range between 20 to 30 degrees Celsius, and they did remain consistent amongst one another. There were no external outliers, nothing crazy shown. There is, however, an increasing trend to be accounted for, and this is because of the program continuing into the warmer summer months. Now, over the last uh, few weeks of the program, I wanted to show specific closer attention to A7 and B12. A7 is Mathis Park and B12 is Summit Avenue. These two sites represent the western and eastern points along the Toms River. Now, both sites did show an increasing trend in temperature. However, A7 showed more variation uh, between each week. And this goes to show because of the entrance of Mathis Park, it does account for two entrances to other bodies of water as well. Meanwhile, B12 is the eastern part of the Toms River, which opens up into the ocean. So here we have a color scaled map showing the mean salinity for each site. You can see it does appear that the salinities are highest at the northern sites, potentially in response to a higher influx of brackish water. However, most of the sites average between five to 10 parts per thousand. These uh, mesohaline conditions are to be expected as is the fluctuation in salinity between approximately five and 18 parts per thousand, predominantly in response to tidal movement of saltier water saltier water into and out of the river. These are our mean turbidity values for each site we sampled. Uh, turbidity basically looks at how well the light can pass through the water. So what I want to point out is some of our southern locations, which are represented by the first set of bars on this graph. The water had more of a reddish orange tint when compared to our northern locations, which is like the second half of the bars. But these southern location values were not out of range from the northern ones. And this could be explained by the presence of tannins in the water. These tannins are highly, highly soluble and will give the water a tinted color, but not necessarily affect the turbidity values. And then we also looked at our turbidity and our total suspended solid. And sometimes these will exhibit similar trends because they both measure simil similar water characteristics. Turbidity again looks at how well light passes through water and the total suspended solids measure the number of like particles in the water. So what I'd like to point out here is when looking at our data, if you look at number seven, which is Mathis Park, had the highest mean turbidity level, but the lowest mean TSS value. And this may be because Mathis Park is at an area of confluence. It is where Jake's Branch and the Winding River meet. So the final particles, the finer particles are carried downstream with the stronger water flow, which can lead to these lower TSS values. So when looking at total suspended solids by site, we can see as boxed off that the B sites have higher values. Um, this, so the B sites are on the northern end of the river. So this can be attributed to the prevailing south to north wind that are found in the summer months, which stir up the sediment more. And in addition, compared to the A sites, which had a more sandy substrate, the um, B sites had a more silty substrate, which is easier to be suspended in the water column. Additionally, even though, as I will talk about later, there was no significance between total suspended solids and chlorophyll, um, the higher values in the B sites could be because of chlorophyll. Additionally, with the chlorophyll values, we see higher amounts in the B sites. This 
um, is a little unusual because typically there's higher chlorophyll with um, lower salinity in shallower water. But as talked about previously, the B sites had higher salinity compared to the A sites. So then you have to look at other reasons for this. Um, therefore, we can once again point to the prevailing um, south to north winds being a reason for the higher chlorophyll values. So looking at a comparison between the two and looking at this graph, um, an outlier of y equals 363 was removed um, just for visual clarity. But additionally, when a regression was run with an alpha of 0.05 on the two parameters, um, there is a p-value of 0.156, which shows a lack of significance between the two parameters. Um, and therefore, the null hypothesis that there is no significant relationship between chlorophyll and total suspended solids cannot be rejected. Additionally, there is a very low R squared value of 0 0.007, which shows that there's very low correlation in the data. So there's a few reasons that this could be um, true. So species of algae and age impact the amount of chlorophyll found, making a chlorophyll A test not necessarily a good measure of al algae biomass. Additionally, other particulates such as the silts that I um, mentioned earlier could be contributing more to the total suspended solids than algae does. Also, again, just a conclusion that the prevailing south to north wind during the summer pushes against the northern shore, which leads to the higher total suspended solids in chlorophyll. So DO is an effective indicator of ecosystem health as it often correlates with the presence of photosynthetic organisms and therefore the environment's overall capacity to support other life. DO is inversely correlated with salinity. So as salinity increases, the oxygen saturation of the water will decrease. Also in general, the more turbid an environment is, the less dissolved oxygen will be present. This is due to fluctuations in other parameters, such as an increase in temperature that occurs in turbid conditions relative to clearer waters. As higher water temp will decrease the water's ability to absorb at atmospheric oxygen. Also, the more turbid an environment is, the less sunlight aquatic photosynthetic organisms will receive, overall decreasing their oxygen output. It's also important to note that of these factors, any of them can be heavily manipulated by tidal influence as well as the benthic topography of the environment. So here we have a scatter plot comparing the DO and chlorophyll level levels recorded during our study. Typically, we would expect to see a direct correlation between the chlorophyll and DO. Again, high chlorophyll levels will indicate the presence of phytoplankton and other aquatic algae and plants. More specifically, as the duration of sunlight increases during the day, there will be an increase of photosynthetic activity and therefore higher levels of DO in the water and thus lower levels of DO overnight. Our team sampling occurred Monday and Tuesdays, approximately between 7 and 9 a.m. So it is possible that the relatively low levels of dissolved oxygen and chlorophyll were measured, it's probably because it was too early in the morning. Now, as you can see from the high p-value on the scatter plot above, there's no significant correlation between the samples DO and chlorophyll levels. This could be due in part to any number of environmental factors, but is likely, again, a result of the early sampling times. So here we have a color scaled map of the mean dissolved oxygen levels of each site. All of the previously mentioned factors, again, can be heavily manipulated by currents and tidal influence. Certain areas may be prone to receiving warmer tides or lower water levels and even varying salinities, such as in an eddy or a cove. All of the parameters have the capability to vary significantly, even within a small geographical area. It's important to note here as well that Site 1 is Jeffreys Creek. It's nearly entirely enclosed. It's a pond um, and had, it did have the lowest DO levels. As we can see though, the dissolved oxygen values nearly follow an ascending order beginning at the southernmost site two, closest to the mouth of the river and following along the river's edge, ending at our study's northernmost site that connects to the mouth of the river on the opposite side. This is due largely in part to tidal influence and natural currents. There may be higher levels of mixing along the northern sites. 
DO is likely higher in areas where the current is stronger as running water allows for higher concentrations of atmospheric oxygen to be absorbed. Also, the bulkheading that's found along most of our northern sites may play a factor in causing an increase in tidal energy. And this in turn will cause more mixing of water resulting in higher DO values. This is a possible explanation for the dissolved oxygen value gradient that we've noticed along the Toms River. So here we have a similar color, color scaled map of the mean E. coli levels recorded at each site, recorded in colony forming units per 100 milliliters of water. So I'm going to do a general overview, but you can see the um, anytime there's a red dot, it means the mean E. coli levels at this site um, exceeded the threshold for safe swimming at 200 colonies per 100 milliliters. Um, so going forward in my next couple slides, anytime we're exceeding a value, it is that designated 200 colonies per 100 milliliters. So the first site we have here is um, Jeffreys Creek A1, which did exceed um, the threshold. And Megan mentioned before that it's expected to test high for bacteria because of the presence of geese um, and other animals like that. Um, and then we can go through, so, and then the darkest green is where we had the lowest levels, which is around below, uh, below 100 colonies per 100 milliliters. So we have those at sites two and three, which is uh, Station Ave and Avon Road. Um, and they both tested around uh, 50 colony forming units per 100 milliliters. And then site four is Beechwood Beach, where we recorded the highest average, which was 381. The mean was 381 colony, colonies per 100 milliliters. And this was also a location where we collected our maximum value, which was uh, 1,950 col colony forming units per 100 milliliters. Um, and a couple times we reached values around that at that site. Um, and then we have these four yellow dots in a row were around 150. And this was Beachwood, Beachwood Beach Yacht Club, Cedar Point, Mathis Park, and Cedar, Ro Cedar Road. Um, and these are all approaching that threshold, but our mean value was not over that threshold. And our site nine was... Um, Money Island, and that was around 100 colonies per 100 milliliters. And then we have Dillon's Creek West, which is site 10. And this, this was around uh, 356 colonies, colonies per 100 milliliters. So that was our second highest site. Um, and it, it was a little interesting because we had a couple outlier dates, which we'll see in the next graph. And then our final two were uh, Dillon's Creek Marina and Summit Ave, which were around 100 to 150. So this is a frequency graph of the days of E. coli levels exceeding the threshold of 200 colonies per 100 milliliters. So um, for example, we'll look at Beachwood Beach, which is A4. We know that site did have an average over the threshold, but it also had many days. It had nine days where it exceeded that threshold. And then Jeffreys Creek A1 had 11 days where it exceeded that threshold. And then you can look down at Dillon's Creek uh, B10, which is what I mentioned before, had a couple um, outlier numbers where there weren't as many days and it wasn't as consistent exceeding that level, but it did have four days where it exceeded the level over our 16 days. And then you can see in Beachwood Beach Yacht Club and Cedar Point, those were our next highest days where they both exceeded the threshold seven out of the 16 days and five out of the 16 days. And the final aspect of E. coli we will look at is the relationship between E. coli and rainfall. You could say it was kind of fortunate for us. We never had to sample in the rain, which is 
interesting because if we were later in the summer, we definitely would have had to sample in the rain, but we had mainly two rainfall events um, that affected our sampling, but they were both on, so you can see, um, oh, I'll explain this uh, graph a little bit. So it's an average, our average E. coli in colonies per 100 milliliters across all sites. So on, this is separated by our date of sampling rather than our site. So each week the um, sampling was, it's, it's interesting because they were somewhat similar, but then on these days where we did experience rainfall events in the past 48 hours, they were much higher. You can see on June 29th, we had rain in the past 48 hours. And on July 7th, there were high amounts of rain that night, the night before. And I color coded this a bit to see where the most rain was in the darkest blue. And then the lightest blue had the least rain and the gray would have had no out, uh, no rainfall in the past 48 hours. So our conclusions for the project. First, there are areas that are on average are above the bacterial threshold of 200 colonies with, um, per 100 milliliters. And these are Jeffries Creek, which is site A1, Beachwood Beach, which is site A4, and Dillon's Creek, which is site B10. Additionally, Jeffries Creek and Beachwood Beach consistently test above the bacterial threshold of 200 colonies per 100 milliliter. The northern part of the river has water quality, which is largely dependent on the prevalent south to north wind that I talked about previously. And finally, tidal conditions may impact flow and therefore impact the water quality parameters, such as how the ability to flush impacts the bacterial concentrations, which could be playing a role in um, the high values in some of the places. All right, so we just wanted to say thank you for Safe Barnegat Bay and supporting our study, along with Clean Ocean Action for providing us with guidance, and all of the towns along the Toms River for allowing us to sample twice per week during the summer. Nice job. This is the highlight reel. <laughs> There are highlights. <laughs> so you all did a fantastic job. It looks like you have a list of questions to start to tackle in the chat box. You want to do that on your own? I can um, take that that latest question um, from Christine. It says, "Did you assume that all the bacteria that grew on your plates were E. coli, or did you type them in a different way?" So we had E. coli, and we also had other coliforms. The way the Easy Gel. Um, the Colskin Easy Gel works. So the E. coli, I think I'll find the slide if we can go back to it. I don't know if it's pretty early, but yeah, it's slide 16 under procedure bacteria testing. That so you can see here A7, there's different color and that little, that's our Petri dish after it had been incubated for 24 hours. The darkest blue dots are the E. coli and then the pink dots are, um, what we noted as other coliforms. So we only really looked at the E. coli overall, but there were, on the days where there were high levels of E. coli, you can see this is one of our highest days, A7. There was a lot of um, pink in there as well. Um, so we were designating E. coli different than other bacteria, but we were able to record the other bacteria, but we didn't include it in this part of, in this presentation if that's enough to answer your question. Sounded good, Emily. Yeah. Well. Anna's asking, um, did you see a, oh, I scrolled. Did you see any change in suspended solids turbidity after storm events? Um, I could do that one. <laughs> um, I looked at the 29th, which there was rainfall 24 hours before, and then the 7th, which there was rainfall the night before. And the total suspended solids were higher those days than they were when you looked at like any singular event and they were higher than like the mean of our entire study. But when I looked at the turbidity, I really didn't see much of a trend that happened after rainfall events, but definitely with the suspended solids though, they were, they were higher. If that answers. <laughs> There's a, go ahead. Uh, uh, my question, um, just to kind of highlight, cause you went over the different sites and how they failed so often. 
um, what during what months do the does the health department uh, test designated swimming areas because those failures are actually in an even smaller amount of time right because they don't test after a certain amount of months so do you know which months they test might be a question for John or Britta yeah I was gonna say I think dr. one yeah, that, that's uh, they, they test basically when the when the beaches are swimmable beaches so we're talking about like June you know all the way through whenever you know whatever happened with Beachwood Beach and I know that there were some other things that they were looking at as well but it's usually this this time of year during the active swimming you know season when the beaches are open for people right. to go swimming so right around Memorial you know right around that Memorial Day time frame through Labor Day really this year might be a little bit off because of COVID-19, yeah. but essentially municipalities determine when to hire their lifeguards for bay beaches and ocean beaches, depending if they're an ocean-bound town. And essentially the health department kicks in around that same time, like John said, typically around Memorial Day could be a weekend or two difference from that. So those failures to me are even more alarming given their frequency in such a short period of time. Yeah, and especially the fact, just to chime in, that some of the days we didn't have rainfall, you know, for greater than 48 hours. It could have even been a week in some durations. And then um, a couple times, you know, at, at some of those locations, we had levels that were higher than, you know, we, we thought should, should be there at that time. It was, it, was, uh, it was like we had rain the night before, but there was no, you know, no evidence of that. So. I will say on behalf of Beachwood, not that I speak for them, but <laughs> to say something um, positive about at least that particular problem, they've been aware of it for many years. Our program specifically helped to uh, shine a light on some of the issues there. And the mayor and council, even though there's been obviously political turnover, has spent time and money millions of dollars to try to remedy the situation. And it's still an ongoing concern. And their mayor, their council, their engineers are fully engaged and really excited about you know, the work that you did. They saw numbers coming in from the health department sort of alongside of your team's work. They're very aware this is not gonna be news to them and they're very concerned about it and excited about the upcoming project with Clean Ocean Action which I'll talk about, you know, maybe as you finish answering your questions. I have a quick question, uh, for, if you'll permit me. Um, it's about uh, the Dillon's Creek sites, 10 and 11. You essentially have here, and I, and I understand these sites have been picked and been used for a long time, but um, to me, they're essentially different. We have two sites in a narrow tidal creek which would be geomorphically very different than the sites in the Toms River estuary, which is a wide tidal estuary. So they probably have different tidal prisms, uh, different discharge rates. And I noticed that Dillon's Creek had higher turbidity and there are higher suspended solids. So do you think that those conditions may have played a role in, in some of the findings that you, you, you've gotten? I think that, Anywhere that there's going to be like a higher presence of waterfowl, which I know we did have at like our creek sites. Um, okay. Yeah. I think it's going to definitely, it's definitely going to up the suspended solids for sure. Um, and I do know because they're close to the marina and even us stepping into the water, we could disturb some of the sediment too. So that might kind of make it a little more turbid than it would be without us walking around there or the boats going through. Yeah, the western, to add what Rachel said, the western uh, Dillon's Creek site um, was more, we walked into the water to collect the sample and it was um, a residential area mm -hmm. um, with a lot, there was usually a goose sitting right next to me when I took the sample and then the um, eastern site was a marina and we didn't step into the water. So I think those could definitely add, those are probably pretty big reasons behind the different levels. All right, well, thank you. I just want to say very quickly, congratulations to both teams for your very impressive work. And I think you did a terrific job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Uh, we have a question from Michelle. Do you, um, did you compare DO against coliform? It looks like that may be correlated. 
I don't think we did a correlate. Guys, did we do anything like comparing those two specifically? Uh, no, we didn't like, do that um, because the main thing we were doing with the color form was seeing like when it um, exceeded the 200 um, CFU is 100, 100 milliliter to kind of see from a health perspective more than do the correlations with mm -hmm. the water quality parameters themselves. Those were just kind of for a basis. Um, those comparisons to see like where the water quality was at in those areas. It could make sense though, just because I know we talked about DO levels having a correlation with kind of the like amount of photosynthetic organisms and then probably a correlation with other aquatic organisms and they all like defecate. So I mean, <laughs> you know, that could, it could be a thing. I, who knows, something to look into. We have a question on Facebook. Um, they just want a clarification on where Jeffrey's Creek is. Um, they're paddlers and they've never heard of it. It's, if you so, go, um, I don't know if they know where the main street is in Ocean Gate. Do well, just know? describe it from the street then, just to give so if, you come off, if you're heading towards the main road, if you're heading into Ocean Gate, it's like, I think it's, one or two turns before you hit the main street in Ocean Gate and you make a right if you're cut heading you're coming off of Chelsea. So yeah. if you're on Chelsea, you would make that right on Ocean Gate Drive. And it's like it's this little pond that would come up on your left. It's this ocean it's like it's this big gravel lot. It, it literally it has the sign right in front. I think um looking back in the presentation it would it would say it. But it normally it's just right off of Chelsea. And you would you, you, years ago, it used to be more open. They used to have a, a miniature Barnegat lighthouse at the entrance, um, and now it is actually filling in. Um, there's an accretion of sand, you know, from sand eroding, probably from Ocean Gate, uh, that's closing the, the mouth of that. So this area that's the drainage area is becoming a little bit more um, enclosed and doesn't flush out as readily, um, that, little, that little aspect. But it's, it's between, yeah, Ocean Gate and Ber Berkeley Township. I don't think it's somewhere you want to paddle anyway. It's small and it's not, you would just paddle in a circle. So it's not really worth it. I think it's interesting because sometimes we drive, all of us do this, we drive over streams and creeks before we really realize that which ones are named what, um, unless we do this every day. So um, I, right. think we, I think we have one last question here on Zoom from Ed Binkowski. Um, Were there any surprises, pleasant or otherwise, in comparing this data um, from years prior? I would say the fact that like, I mean, one of the things is we didn't really have that much rainfall and not like that's a surprise, but it didn't, I mean, we still surpassed those levels more often than I would have thought because you would think the rainfall would kind of flush it out. Like we know that happens and it kind of gets released out of like, like the backflow of, you know, storm drain systems and sewer systems and, you know, it's pulling stuff off land from like animals and we still had, you know, I think two or three days that we could really blame it on the storms and otherwise every other time that we were over that 200 threshold it was just because of it just is so and adding on to that um there is this one day in particular where all sites were above below the um, 200 level except beechwood which was in the thousands and there had been no rainfall um so that was just like something to add. It was a surprising look that there really is something different there from just it being the runoff. Well, I want to congratulate all of you. It was a fantastic piece of work that you did. Normally, we only have three members to our water quality team. This year, we took on five. And that's a lot to work with each other, to learn each other's styles and coordinate. Uh, in a new lab that was funded uh, in part by the Ocean First Foundation at the Eco Center here at Save Barnegat Bay. We chose to do a lot more sites than we would normally sample. And I know it was brought up that the sites were different. We in part did that because we wanted to include all six river towns. So we kind of knew going into it that there were gonna be different issues with each uh, town and the site specifically. 
you did a, a great job in, in making consistent data, I think, to inform us going forward. And the real exciting part about your work is we received a grant with our good partners at Clean Ocean Action through the DEP to work with all six towns called Rally for Barnegat Bay. Clean Ocean Action has been working up in Monmouth County to bring in specially trained dogs that can sniff out sanitary leaks underneath the land, sanitary sewer leaks under the land or infrastructure problems. And so all of your work, your hard work this summer will provide a baseline for that project as it moves forward. I think it's gonna be really helpful to the whole team. And I think on one more level, just the engagement of the townships, you know, with this project, learning a little bit more. And as we move along, we'll all learn more about water quality and the river itself. And um, we'll teach more skills to people, citizen water quality scientists moving forward. So thank you so much, John and the whole team it's a fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you, Britta. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, job, Dr. Team. Manek and Britta. Grace Ann. Yeah. Good job, team.